song I will probably play and play let him on, come up. The first one. Oh, allow him time to come up for announcement. Okay. That's all. Yeah. I'll probably pray and let him come up for announcement. Oh. Yeah, this is not bad. Come on, let's see. It's not that long. He's going to fly. Huh? Yeah, just back away. Let him, let him come up for the middle. Good morning, Village Parkway. Stand and sing with us. Let us be teachable, let us be people after your own heart, and let us um, just be attentive to what you have to show us today. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. Good morning. Okay, uh, time for the announcements. Today we have the missions offering, and uh, that's for the missions. And um, I think someone is supposed to... Okay. Good morning, everyone. I wasn't sure if I was going to do this or not because the youth were leading today and didn't want to mess their plans up. Uh, but I'm on the Honduras missions team. My name is Kyle. And uh, <clears throat> so the missions committee asked me to come up here and just uh, share this uh, quarterly missions moment with you. 
The reason we have a uh, too loud. <laughs> the reason we have a, uh, a a quarterly missions offering is to support our mission teams that go out uh, throughout the world, uh, really Central America, Mexico, uh, Poland this year, you guys, and uh, we go all over the place. And and so we give this opportunity. Uh, there's a proverb that says, a, a generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will be watered himself. And I found that to be so true when I went to Honduras for the first time, hoping to be a blessing you know, to the people there and to, to share with them the love of Christ. Well, I myself was blessed by the people I met, the things I got to do. It was, it was very rewarding. So as the Lord leads today, uh, pray what you would do to, to help with our missions team. It doesn't have to be money. You know, it could be your, your time and materials. Uh, if you want to join one of the teams, uh, that's, there's many out there. So just check the front office, uh, see what you can do. And as the Lord leads, uh, 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 pray, uh, pray with me now for this, this time. Dear Lord, we thank you for this uh, youth-led time today in, in worship. And we just ask, Lord, to be a, a blessing to everyone who's here. Uh, Lord, we just ask that uh, you would bless our mission teams. Uh, Father, that you would bless the tithes and offerings for the, the missions to, today, Lord. That you would uh, carry your word of, of love and grace and peace and salvation uh, to the world as you would have it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, and um, for the money to go to the missions offering, that's going to have to actually be written on the envelope. And um, tonight is the TNT lock-in, and um, Saturday, I think that's this Saturday? Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, is going to be a TNT quiz at the First Baptist Church, Universal City. And, um, okay, so the women's min ministry is going to be having a Stitches of Love Fellowship, and they're going to be, uh, I guess, making dresses and prayer shawls for the Honduras mission team to take over to Honduras, and that's going to be on Saturday, February 25th at 11 a.m. over in the fellowship hall, and there's going to be a potluck lunch. And March 3rd is the church work day. We really need help with that. And so if you're willing to do some work, um, just sign up in the Welcome Center or use the registration card and um, the insert in your bulletin. Okay, and the Courageous Resolution Ceremony, March 4th during the early service. That's for any man who uh, wants to sign up for that. And... Um, it, you can come, but it would be best if you were to sign up. Okay, and the Agape Pregnancy Center is having their annual gala um, on March 22nd at the Vista Room of the Valero Corporate Offices. They're going to have a guest speaker, Bruce Wilkinson, and they're going to have some uh, hors, hors d'oeuvres, apparently. And um, register by March 18th um, to attend. And that's going to be, yeah. <laughs> okay, if you're a guest today, we'd like to welcome you. And we'd like you to take the insert in your bulletin and fill it out so that we can have a record of your visit. And now we would ask that guests stay seated, seated and that Village Parkway members, uh, stand up and shake hands with someone you haven't seen today.
celebrate the light. And when I stumble in the darkness, I will call your name by night. God of wonders beyond our galaxy, you are holy, holy. Universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to the Lord of heaven and earth. that you help us and guide us through our day and I'm thank, thankful that you got the youth to you know be on stage for this stuff and it's going well so far so thank you for that and help everyone through their troubles and guide us through life I live with us in Jesus name amen how lovely is your dwelling place oh Lord almighty for my soul longs and even faints for you. Lord, hear my heart is satisfied within your presence. I sing beneath the shadow of your How lovely is your dwelling place, O oh Lord. Oh. To the God of this. Peace to the restless. There is no 
Jacob when he was uh, really sick in the hospital. Um, he just everything we were going through uh, every time like we felt we couldn't go on. Uh, God just kept helping us through and carrying us and um, just the light of God was like so strong in him and uh, he was such an inspiration. And we just praise God for everything we went through and uh, for putting his healing hand on Jacob and our whole family. So it's called hope. <laughs> um, I've heard it said that sometimes things fall apart so that other things can fall together. This is truth. In this life, we break, we fall, we lose. Sometimes we feel too broken to piece ourselves back together. And sometimes we fall so deep, we feel like we can never come back up. Sometimes we lose so much, we feel there is nothing else to lose. But amidst all the pain, all the confusion, all the loss, there is always a hope. It's hard to see it because sometimes it doesn't show up in a tangible way. It's hard to believe it's there. Sometimes it's nearly impossible for us to hold on to the hope that there is hope, but there is. Bad things happen, tragedies occur, dreams fade, and our world seems to become an unfamiliar blur. But in the end, if we hold on to the truth, to one hope, and to God, we'll make our way out of the tunnel, and we'll make our way into the light. Not only so, but we also glorify in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Romans 5, 3 through 4. Good morning. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Troy Walker. I'm 17. I'm senior, and I'm um, I'm going to be attending Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, their college program. Uh, my goal is to get a, a bachelor's of humanities with a concentration on missions, and then go on for my master's in divinity. I feel that God has called me um, to be a missionary in America to the churches specifically to help reform them and revive them back to the institute that God created them to be. 
Um, one second. Technology. <laughs> Got it. All right, I'm going to be talking today, or preaching today, out of Romans 1, 18 through 32. And I feel this, or this is a message that God gave me. I was reading my nightly Bible, my nightly devotional, and I read over this passage, and I could feel God telling me that he wanted me to share this with the church. He wanted me to tell this, to get the message out. And... I sent an email to Pastor Steve, and through him, through the church, and through God, through the Holy Spirit working in him, um, I'm here today preaching. So, um, I think everyone here would agree that America has fallen away from God, for the most part. And we know that God punishes those who fall away from him. To return to God, we need to pray and fast and acknowledge that he is God and honor him through our actions. Let's read the first part of the, ch of the chapter 18 through 20, says, For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of this world, his invisible attributes, his internal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. We know God. We know that there is a God, and we choose to ignore him through our actions. We know that God has an anger because he is just, he is holy, and yet we still, we have no excuse for our actions. Then we know he's God, we know we have no excuse for our actions, and in the next part of the chapter, in 21 through 23, it says, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give him thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the, the glory of an incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. We have, when we don't acknowledge God, our thoughts become futile. And when our thoughts become futile, our actions become futile. And everything we do becomes futile, as if chasing after the wind. Just like in Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, or in Solomon most, the wisest guy ever, because God gave him wisdom, granted him wisdom. And yet when he got to the end of his life, he looks back and he says, this is futile without God. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge, beginning of wisdom. And without God, if you don't acknowledge him and honor him, everything you do becomes worthless, nothing. Um, because we don't see fit to acknowledge God, he turns us over to lust. Romans 1, 24 through 25 says, Therefore God gave them over to the lust of their heart, gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Then the first thing that God gives them over to is lust. Would they have the futile, mar the futile thoughts and futile actions because they don't acknowledge him, but God lets them, gives them over to lust because they don't acknowledge him. And lust is against our own body. This lust is a sin, is a, is a different kind of sin because all other sins are against the body, or against other people. But lust is against yourself primarily. In 1 Corinthians 6.18, it says, Flee immorality. Every other sin is as a man commits is outside of his body, but the immoral sin commits against his own body. Say you, get, you, you are given over to lust, and you fall into lust, and you watch, and you watch pornography. That is against yourself. You aren't hurting anyone else. You can hurt other people through your actions. But it's not necessarily against other people. You hurt yourself first, and then other people can be hurt because of your actions. Um, lust is so prevalent in our society. It's everywhere. You can see it in the movies. You see it in commercials. You see it in books. You see it on TV. It is in magazines. As you're walking through the impulse aisle at HEB, you, know, you can see just rows of magazines showing things that no one should be looking at unless they're your spouse. And yet, it's accepted in our culture today because God has given us over to lust. Um, and just like a couple weeks ago, the Super Bowl, I don't know how many of you guys watched that, um, but there was a car commercial then for this family-friendly Super Bowl um, event. The car commercial, I believe it was Lexus, where they have the, the ferry and sprinkles the dust on the, the lady, and she has this great dream where 
he, uh, she's on a white horse with a strong guy, and they're going through this fairy tale land. And then the fairy walks over to the other side, trips and spills a bunch of dust on the, the, her, husband, her husband. And the first image you see is this lady in barely any clothing waving a checkered flag for him to go. But their point could have been made without the, the lady there. They, she could have been clothed more appropriately. It's, it's everywhere. And we just accept it because, you know, that's our culture. But as Christians, we're called not to accept this. We're called to have diff- to, we're called to stand out and to say no against the culture. Um, after he gives us over to lust, he gives us over to degrading passions. In verse 26 and 27, For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. For the women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also, the men abandoned the natural function of the women and burned in their desire towards one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. The second thing he gives them over to is degrading passions or homosexuality. And please know that whatever I say here, I'm not bashing homosexuals. Yes, it is wrong. Yes, it is a sin. But all sins are equal in God's eyes. Homosexuality, lying, there's no difference in God's eyes. They all separate God. They all hide God's face from us. They all cause death. Um, We are to be known by our love. We are called as Christians to show love to anyone, including people, um, including people who are struggling with homosexuality. In John 13, 35, Jesus says, by, all, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if we love one another. We are called to, to show them Christianity, show them who God is through our love. If we don't have love, we are nothing. Paul talks about that. If we have love, we're just a clinging. If we don't have love, we're just a clinging gun, saying nothing, just making noise. Um, and Jesus, that's how Jesus showed his love to them by eating with them, staying with them, talking with them, not sinning with them, but being around them. And yes, it is wrong, but we are called to love them because we all sin. Uh, um, it says one thing I want to note here is that it talks about women first being over. Um, given over to degrading passions. And it took me a while to figure out, to, to realize one reason why this is um, the women are first. Because the, when the men of God aren't godly, when they aren't men like they should be, the women need to be fulfilled somehow, and they find each other, and they turn to each other. And then after the women are gone, the men need fulfillment as well, and they've turned to each other. And it's just a downward spiral into eventually death because all sin leads to death. Then not only, it doesn't have to be necessarily women and women and homosexual desires. Unnatural functions, unnatural, um, yes, unnatural functions can also be the women to having to take over to do unnatural roles in the household and the family. When the men of God don't step up and take their place to do what they're called to do as men, the women are left no other choice. And that is also, you, that's a sign of God, leaving, God giving us over to this, is that the women, are, the women have to commit unnatural, or don't have to commit unnatural acts, but the women commit unnatural acts, which causes the men, which can lead the men to commit indecent acts on their own. Um, then the, net, the last thing that he gives them over to is depraved mind. In Romans 18, 28 through 32, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, inventors or insolent, arrogant, boasters, technology, um, boasters, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, and although they know the, ordin- know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they, all- they give hearty approval to those who practice them. That is the last thing that God gives them over to, is all unrighteousness, to a depraved mind. You can see in this passage that he gives them over to so many things, wickedness, evil. And to sum it up, Paul says, all unrighteousness. There's nothing unrighteous that we will not commit. And not only do they practice, do we practice all unrighteousness, we give approval to those who practice it. We, say, we, we bring them along and we help them commit sins and we 
applaud them when they commit sins worthy of death. That is completely rejecting God in every sense of the word. Not, say, not only saying, I reject you, God, but having, uh, helping others to reject him as well. But what are, what is Christian, what are Christians are we uh, called to do? How do we change ourselves as Christians? In Romans 12, 1 through 2, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, to present your, uh, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We are called to have renewed minds. We are called to have changed minds, not depraved minds, renewed minds. We are, when we acknowledge God, our thoughts become futile, or our thoughts don't become futile. We have purpose for our thoughts. We have purpose for our actions. We have renewed minds. When we give ourselves over as living sacrifices, we have renewed minds. And um, I heard this saying about living sacrifices. The, uh, the hard part about living sacrifices is they have a tendency to crawl off the altar. It's true. Even if you willingly put yourself on that altar, you don't want to be there because it's painful, because it hurts, because it causes you to do things that you would not want to do yourself, but you know you're doing it for the hope of what will be for God because you recognize that he is God. We, um, we need to have renewed minds through the Holy Spirit. We can't change our minds. Only the Holy Spirit can through praying, through fasting, through reading your Bible. And that's how we change ourselves. So that's obviously a big part is changing ourselves before we can work on changing the nation. But how are we called to change the nation? Returning to God requires intimacy. Um, in Hosea 6.6, 6, it says, For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifices, and, that, and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. We are called to know God. The root of the Bible is to know God and to make him known. We need to know God comprehensively, intimately. That, the, um, that word know in the Hebrew, the word knowledge in Hosea 6.6, 6, is to understand completely everything about them, to know what they're going to say, to know how they feel, how they're going to respond to situations, to know every single thing about them. Just like a spouse should towards their, um, their companion, should know intimately, comprehensively, everything about them. And that's the way God knows us. We are called to know him that way. And let's go back to Romans 1, uh, 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. When we don't acknowledge God, he gives us over to a depraved mind. When, so we are called to acknowledge God, to know God, to understand that he's there and say, God, you're there. I want to honor you through everything that I do, to give myself over as a living sacrifice to you. The best way to get to know God is to pray, to read, and to ask. What better way to get to know someone than to talk to them? We can talk to God. That's the amazing thing about God, that he allows us to talk to him. And you know, he will talk back if you listen. Then he gave us this amazing book full of knowledge about him. We are called to, we are called to know God, and he gave us this. Every, everything in this book is about him, how he loves, how he responds, how he has compassion, how he's holy, how he punishes us. It's right in here. We're called to read, to know God. And other way is to ask. If we ask God, this is kind of the same as praying, but you can pray to God and not ask him. If we ask God, he will give it to us. For it says in Isaiah 30, 18 through 22, Therefore the, long, the Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are those who long for him. O oh, people of Zion, inhabitant in Jerusalem, you will weep no longer. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. Although the Lord has given you the bread of privation and the water of oppression, he, your teacher, will no longer hide himself, but your eyes will behold your teacher. Your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right or to the left. The great thing about God is he listens. No other God in the history of mankind, or no other false God in the history of mankind, listens and longs to be gracious. God, God sent his son here to die for us because he realized, because he knew and he knows us and knows that we can never be perfect ourselves. He is so gracious. He sent his only son. He sent himself to die for us. 
If he, he, that is the ultimate sign of graciousness, the ultimate sign of love. It's, Jesus says there's no greater show of love than to die for one another, to die for your brother. And he did that himself because he is gracious, because he longs to give us what we want. And because he longs to be intimate, uh, because he longs to give us what we want, we need to be intimate to him. We need to be intimate with God. And intimacy is a two-way street. You can't be intimate with someone and they're not intimate with you. To see inside someone else, you need to open yourself up. Just like David said in the Psalms, search me, Lord, know my ways. We need to cry that to we need to cry to God and say, search me, God, so that you can know me and I can know you. If we don't know God, we won't follow what he says because we don't understand how gracious he is, how amazing he is. When we know God, we want to follow his commandments because you realize that he is perfect. When, um, when we follow his commandments, when we acknowledge God, when we honor him, he will turn and he will forgive us. He could even forgive our nation, no matter how far gone it is. He can forgive anything, anyone, anybody, any nation, any tribe, if he wants, if they cry to him, if they mourn for what they have done. When we, when we fast, we grow more intimate with God. Fasting is giving up something so that you can show God that you're, you're repentant, to show that God that you care, that you realize that he's more than the things of this world, that he's more than food, that he's more than TV, that he's more than your shiny sports car, that he's more than money, that he's more than anything, and that you're willing to give it all for him. Daniel, uh, in Daniel 10, 2, th- uh, 2 and 3, he says, And at that time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no m- meat, no wine touched my lips, and I used no lotion at all until the three weeks were over. We need to mourn for our country. We re- I've shown, I've, I've, you can see that God has given us over, that we, have, we don't acknowledge God that everything we do has become futile because of our thoughts and therefore leading to our actions. We've seen that God has given us over to lust. We've seen that God has given us over to to, um, unnatural relationships, to depraved minds. We've seen all this, and we can see these patterns in our country. We need to mourn for our country so that God will, so that we can repent and that God will turn away from, return his anger away from us. If we don't mourn, we will be destroyed. If we don't turn we will be destroyed because God is, a God, God is holy, because God is just. We know that God listens. We, you can see that in Isaiah. He says he longs to be gracious. He longs to give us what we want. We need to talk to him. We need to ask him. We know he wants to give us what we ask for. Then why aren't we asking him? And I'm not, I'm not talking about material possessions here. You can ask God for a car. You can ask God for more money. doesn't mean he'll give it to you. It's, he has his own plan and you need to submit yourself to him. But we need to ask him for spiritual things. We need to ask him to take this temptation away. We need to ask him to heal our country. We need to ask him for anything. We can ask God, and he will answer us if it is in his will. We need to ask God to change our country, to pray for our country um, so, that God will, so that God will turn his compassions on us so that he won't destroy us. In Jonah 3, 4 through 10, uh, it says, Then Jonah went to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God, and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in the ashes. He issued a proclamation, and it said, In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water, but both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth. And let men call on God earnestly, that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hand. Who knows? God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger, so that we will not perish." When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked ways, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring on them, and he did not do it. Nineveh was one of the worst cities in in history completely. 
It was so bad that Jonah, a prophet of God, a man who knew God intimately, didn't want to go there and wanted them to be destroyed. God saw them and saw that they turned away and felt compassion. He is gracious. He wanted to show his compassion, his grace on Nineveh. Jonah went there and it's a huge city. Three days walk to get through one side of the city to the other. He walks one day into the city and starts crying out, you know, God is going to destroy you in 40 days if you don't repent. Re repent, return to him. And what do they do? They fall on their knees and they cry and they mourn to God saying, we're sorry, God. We want to change. Help us change. And he, re he relented. And the king called for a fast. Everybody, not just people, flocks, animals, herds, no, no food, no water. And God, rep God relented because the people repented. If we were to fast for our country, we would see incredible changes. I mean, imagine if all the churches and all the people in San Antonio fasted. What kind of changes we would see. Imagine what would happen if we fell on our knees and cried to God for our city and for our nation. It would be astronomical. We couldn't even, I can't even explain, I can't even know the depth of what would happen if we cried to God for forgiveness. But on an even bigger scale, what if, like Nineveh, we cried as a nation to God? What if we fasted to him because we realize that we are wrong because we've turned away? If we were to fast as a nation, God would turn and we would be on fire for him. We, we would be the light of nations again. We would be, we would be, I can't even explain it. It's just, we would be on fire for God and he would bestow his blessings on us, and we could be a light to other nations. And if you felt, if you feel the Holy Spirit working in you at all for anything that I've said, if you see that we as a nation has fallen away, we have depraved minds, we have lust, we have unnatural relationships, and we, everything we do is futile, then fast. We need to fast. There's no other way around it. The only thing we can do is to give up part of ourselves to show God that we know he's there, that we acknowledge him, and that we realize that we need him. And for three weeks from today, I'm going to be fasting for a nation. Not, I know three weeks is a long time, but fasting like Daniel did, um, eating no rich foods, no, uh, no meat, no wine, not that I can drink wine. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and I'm going to be fasting. If you, are, if you feel the Holy Spirit working in you at all for anything that I've said, I want you to fast with me. We can talk after if you want more details, if you need any help. But I want you to fast. I, if our nation fasted, I've said this before, if our nation fasted and became intimate with God, it would change. Everything would improve. Our, our economy would improve. We need, our economy would improve. Our, everything would improve. There would be less crime. Because people see God, they realize what they're doing is wrong. And that... They want to change because they see how good God is, because they see what will happen if they don't change and what will happen if they do change because of hope of what will come. If we fast, if we cry on our knees and mourn to God as a nation, we will change. And like I said, I'm going to be fasting. If you want to fast, feel free. Um, you can talk to me after if you want. But if you see anything that I've said, that our nation is dying and it will be destroyed if we don't change, then let's fast. Um, let's pray. Dear God, um, thank you for letting us come here and worship freely in this country. It's not, not everyone gets to do this, Lord. And please help us to repent, to return to you because we see that you are holy and that you are the only way. Please, God, change our nation. Set us on fire so that we in San Antonio, for we at Village Parkway Baptist Church, can change our city, which can change our nation. Um, then, God, please forgive us for everything we do wrong, because we deny you daily, Lord. And just let us be on fire for you. In your name we pray. Amen. Night with the men. Thank you. You, 
you just voice what Dr. Montavon said to us on Monday night. Dr. Montavon, Monday night, told the men of this church that we face some of the most difficult days you've ever imagined ahead as a nation. He says, coming from all the brainwashing that took place of him as a communist leader, well, the communist leaders to him, he was tortured and everything else. He says, I hear nothing but the same threats across your media, out of your leaders and everything else. But he said, it is not a political problem. It is a spiritual problem. So this is kind of a challenge to us, and I appreciate Troy challenging us this morning. Life is more than just about us walking through and doing a few things. It's about a heart that has such a deep passion for Christ that it is unbelievable. And so we've had a good young challenge today to us to take seriously our walk in Christ Jesus. And that we will be salt and light in a very tough world nowadays to be salt and light in. But I'll tell you what, the world is hungry to know that Jesus Christ sits on the throne. And you and I have the privilege and honor to be able to do that. But to be able to do that, there's got to be a deep, deep passion in your heart. Thank you for doing that. In fact, your sermon was my letter to Jimmy Carter when I was your age. He and I talked about it the other day. I wrote a letter to Jimmy Carter, almost word for word what you just did, from Romans 1 all the way through the progression many, many years ago. So I appreciate your passion. And I appreciate you guys leading us today in worship. This has been a great day. Now what we're going to do is we're going to stand. And if you need to respond as any way as pastor, I'll be available. But lead us in, a, in an invitation, and then we'll close in a moment. now. <laughs> Y'all don't know how hard that was. You know, the first time I ever did that, I was through in five minutes. And then I spent the next 30 minutes repeating what I said in five minutes. So you did well. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Thank you for being here today. Lord bless you. Have a great day. Lead us in our benediction and then we'll be dismissed. We have a benediction? No, we didn't have an invitation either, but that's okay. <laughs> We can do the same thing again. Y'all ready? Do the same thing again, and then y'all have a great day. We'll see you later. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory.